Welcome back to the channel, guys. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. We're actually playing with different balls today. It's not footballs. Today, I'm going to be out on the golf course. So I've got the day off today and I thought I'm going to do a little bit of a different video to what we used to do. And I'm going to be doing a vlog style video. I'm going to be taking you around the golf course. I'm going to be answering questions. I'm going to be talking about my coaching life, how I got into coaching, how I got into YouTube, and hopefully answering some questions that I frequently get from some of our followers. If you've got any questions, then comment down here and we might answer them in the next one. And we won't be showing you every single shot because I know not everybody appreciates watching golf. But between shots and between holes, we will be talking about some of my favourite coaching topics or some of the things that really inspire me as a coach. I hope you enjoy the video, guys. Please try and refrain from commenting on my golf swing. I know it's not the best. I know it needs work. It's exactly why I'm here. But hope you enjoy the video. Let's get straight out and get hitting some balls. Well guys, we're not off to a great start to the day. So first of all, I made myself a nice hot cup of coffee because it is freezing today, very icy conditions. Um, and I left it at home. I can literally picture where it is on the kitchen side. So I definitely forgot that. And then I bought myself a nice new golf t-shirt so that I could uh, look really smart and slick on the course. And it's buried under about 16 layers because it's absolutely freezing. So yeah, not off to a great start, but let's see how we get on on the first hole. So first topic I want to talk about, guys, is academy football. I get questioned about academy football quite a lot. Is it right for my kid? Is it right for everybody? Should we join an academy team? We've been offered um, or scouted. So what should be the process for a parent or for a child in that situation? I genuinely think it's one of those things that is only suitable for some people. Not every kid is cut out for the pressured environment. Not every kid will thrive in that environment. While some will, some really won't. I've seen both ends of the spectrum where I've coached kids that have ended up going on to academy football and progressing all the way through it and doing really well and getting selected for under 21s and under 18s. But they are a real rarity. And I've also seen the worst end of the scale, which is where kids have lost confidence, where kids have been subjected to poor coaching um, and just really actually found it a detrimental thing for their development and for their confidence sometimes because of the wrong academy sometimes the wrong environment but also sometimes just the wrong age and they've gotten a little bit too early they weren't emotionally ready for it the parents weren't prepared for exactly what academy football was going to entail and then they end up in a situation where the kid's taking a shot to the confidence and they almost have to rewind or start to unravel some of the work that's been done to then try and rebuild that child's confidence so my best advice is you've got to make your own decision but you've got to be very very careful you need to know the pitfalls you need to speak to as many different parents as you can who already have their kid in academies or have tried academy football go watch sessions yourself see if if you do get invited to an academy ask the coach if you can go down and watch two or three sessions before you actually decide to join and remember the main thing especially when we're talking about children is enjoyment within football it's not all about that development that goes straight to the top of the pyramid do your absolute best to make sure they're playing with a smile on the face and if your child comes off the pitch whether they're playing in grassroots football or an academy if they're not smiling then make a change So next little part my, about me guys, um, so my family life, I have a girlfriend Sarah who I've been with for just over four years. We've got two sons, we've got Frankie who's 11, who's a very talented little footballer and is absolutely obsessed with the game which obviously makes me feel great. We watch Liverpool games together, we've been watching the World Cup matches together um, and we've sort of really bonded really well over football. I remember the first time I ever met him. We sat down and played FIFA together and he looked at me almost as if like, wow, it's like having an older brother, someone who I can play FIFA with, I can talk football with, because um, obviously you can't quite do that with mums, right? 
Oh, not Sarah anyway. She's not as big a football fan as I am. Um, and then I've got Ace, who's my youngest son. He's only two. Um, and he's not really got into football yet, but I'm not pushing it. I think sometimes as a parent, especially when I'm involved in football, kids and, and parents always assume that I'm going to be like fanatical about football. So I'm going to be pushing it on my kids. Absolutely not. I want my kids to do whatever they enjoy. Um, he picks the ball up sometimes and he plays a little bit. He's picked up golf clubs. He's picked up pretty much anything he can throw around. Um, but I'm just a big advocate of kids finding things and doing things when you know they develop a love for it without having to push it too hard. So hopefully one day he does start to play some football. Hopefully he likes it as much as Frankie. But at the same time, if he wants to play piano, if he wants to break dance, whatever he wants to do, you know what it's like as long as your kids are happy. But the main thing for me is the support that I get from home makes all this YouTube stuff possible. I work long hours. Um, I'm usually in the office by sort of nine, half nine on a morning. I'm usually not getting home till 8 p.m. on a night. And then the YouTube stuff has to fit in and around that when I can on days off, on weekends, on anything else that I can fit in. And Sarah's been very, very supportive of that. She does everything she can to make sure that I've actually stuck to this YouTube stuff, you know, on days when you, you're lacking ideas, when you just can't quite be bothered squeezing the time in. And she's been a real advocate of me sort of doing things um, just, just basically to, to keep going and show the consistency that I have, which is how we've got to 20,000 subscribers as we broke recently. We've gone over 2 million views. So a big thank you to all you guys. Big thank you to her for all the support. Big thank you to you guys as well. So next question guys is how much football do I play? I actually don't play football really anymore. I mean, as you can imagine in coaching sessions, I literally coach 11, 12 different sessions every week. Um, so that's 11 or 12, 12 hours of coaching combined with, you know, the hours and hours and hours and hours that I've put in to practicing myself, to making sure that I can develop techniques so that I can coach them to kids. Um, and over the thousands of hours that I've coached, I have just found that I find it quite difficult to play now. I think when I play football, I critique my own performance. I, I understand every bad touch and why I made it or how it happened. But it also just really frustrates me. And the last sort of five or six times that I played, I actually played indoor. Um, I used to love indoor football. You know, the, uh, the sort of giant tennis ball style. Um, and yeah, every time I played, I just found that afterwards I was quite frustrated. I felt like I'd made more mistakes than I should have done overanalyzed the performance and yeah just just found it frustrated me more than i enjoyed it um so that's why i play the game of golf because i think my expectations are lower i know that i'm not a great golfer i know that i don't spend anywhere near enough practice time to actually be a great golfer but at the same time because my expectations are lower i can finish a round when i've played really well or when i've not played very well and just be quite relaxed about it and just take it for what it is i know that i'm not going to be tiger woods any any day soon but i also I just find that I'm more relaxed on a golf course. If I make mistakes, I expect them. And when I'm making mistakes, I'm not critiquing myself as much because I'm not a golf coach and I don't know how to fix some of the mistakes that I make with a golf club. But yeah, every time I, uh, I play football, I just find it really difficult to not overanalyze the mistakes. So I don't really play much anymore. Um, do miss it sometimes, but like I say, I get to play plenty with the kids. I get to play literally 11, 12 hours every single week on the pitches where you know we're doing coaching demonstrations we're helping kids with learning techniques so i still get to play a fair amount in that aspect but i don't play competitively and i certainly sort of don't get much time these days either um by the way absolutely beautiful day on the golf course it is still probably zero degrees maybe one degrees outside but beautiful day now the sun's come out This course that I'm playing today, guys, actually doubles as a full golf course as well. So it's a little par three course, just a Leeds Golf Centre I like. And yeah, it's a, it's a foot golf course alongside the par three course that I'm playing today. So I'm definitely going to have to come back and uh, give it a go on foot golf as well. Hopefully I'll score better than I'm scoring with the golf club today. little side note from the football guys on the golf course today i don't think i've ever played a course that is this 
um, tough and, and, and hard really. I don't mean in terms of difficulty, I just mean in terms of the ground because it's so cold this morning. The ball lands and just bounces any way it wants. Um, it's probably adding an extra 20, 30 yards to every tee shot, which is great when you're trying to get extra distance, but this is a short par three course. So the, most of the shots that I'm trying to play that are bouncing in and around the green, they're bouncing way right, way left. The tee shot on this one that I've just hit, the, the ball was already traveling right and then hit. I mean, it looked like it hit some kind of rock, but it's probably just hitting the ground that's so firm because of the frost on it. Um, and yeah, the ball started about five yards right, ended up about 25 yards right. So I don't even know if I'm going to be able to find this one, but we'll, we'll see. Tough course today, tough conditions. So the next topic we're going to talk about guys is tactics and my teams and how my teams play. I've not actually run a team for a couple of years now. I've run grassroots teams um, and teams with kids of pretty decent ability levels for quite a while. So my main experience in grassroots football was running Catalan soccer teams and we played in the local leagues within Leeds, but we also played against other, um, other academies and stuff as well. And for me, the thing that made me fall in love with football coaching was the Spanish team that dominated um, not well not just the national team but the way that Barcelona and Madrid dominated as well um, over that sort of uh, 2010 period uh, when they won the Euros when they won the World Cup for me that was the epitome of how football should be played it was the most enjoyable to watch it was the most interesting I think some people see that style that possession sort of tactic as boring and personally for me I, I think you know you could, you could call it boring you could call chess boring but when you really boil down to it there isn't a, a style of football that requires more patience more understanding from your players they have to have very very good tactical knowledge themselves not just as coaches but as your players as well um, I think it takes a heck of a lot of technical proficiency to be that good in possession then the technical level of the players has got to be absolutely exceptional um, and they're all things that really resonate with me as a coach I, i'm a very technical coach i prefer to coach technique and and break down techniques whether it comes to the basics of passing or the most advanced striking techniques you can think of the the real mechanics of the techniques are, are really what sort of inspire me to coach and, and how to help kids especially break those down make them as simple as possible and then make them as technically proficient as possible you know by coaching them through those steps um so for me, whenever I coach teams, I always, always, always try to make sure they were technically proficient. And as a general rule, you'd find that you'd then win. But obviously in grassroots football, in all football, the game can go against you. Sometimes the team that has the most possession doesn't always win the game. But it really was enjoyable to me to see that kids were actually able to recreate some of the incredible things that professional footballers do and how well they keep the ball, the number of passes they can string together, the, the way that they can support each other off the ball to be able to keep possession. So if I was to, you know, put my stamp on a team, it would always be possession first, technique first, and then we build from there. I don't think there's any better feeling than a stress-free par where you don't even bother having to get the putter out the bag and you can just tap in. Hope you're enjoying this video guys. I'm certainly enjoying making it. If you've got any questions or anything that you'd like me to answer in the next video, it could be about me personally, it could be getting to know me a little bit more, it could be more about coaching, it could be a specific problem that you've got. I'm happy to answer any and all questions in these videos. Keep them light-hearted, keep them fun, but also make sure they're informational as well. So if there's anything that you're wanting to ask, just let us know in the comments. Now, I'm not making any excuses, guys. I'm playing okay today. I'm not doing amazing, but I'm playing all right. 
But these conditions are so seriously some of the hardest I've ever played. Just check out the bounce on these greens. So I'm on the green here, ball in hand, bounce the ball into the floor. I mean, how are you supposed to play onto a green when it's literally bouncing that hard? So yeah, I'm not playing too badly and I've actually made a couple of pars, but at the same time, I think better conditions, I might have even uh, got a birdie or two. I'm reading the greens pretty well. I just can't seem to sink one. About to play the next hole, guys, which actually last time I was here, I got a hole in one on this hole. Now, I didn't get it on camera, but Frankie was with me and he witnessed it. And he, he witnessed me jumping around like a six year old as well after I did it. Um, it's a very short hole. It's actually only about 56 yards, I think, from the back tees. So it's it's not very long at all, but still counts, right? Hit it from the tee, land in the hole. That's a hole in one. Don't care what anybody says. Slightly off the green here, so I'm going putter because the green is a little bit more of an ice rink. So trying to get this to go up, down, and stop is just never going to happen. So I'm just going to try and roll it instead. There you go guys, last time I played that hole I finished it in one and then this time I finished it in four, but that is golf for you. Next hole's the longest on the course guys, it's 173 yard, still a par three. I don't know if you can see just to the right of that green box, there's the flag. So yeah, probably gonna be the hardest shot that I hit today. So this next one guys, is one of the toughest shots in golf. This is up and over that big bunker to try and then sit it down onto a green when the green is basically made of concrete, the way that it's playing today, this bounce is gonna be very hard to control. All right, next question guys. So a little bit more of a, a fun one, this. Top three footballers of all time. Um, for me, personally, I've always idolized those players who are a little bit smaller, a little bit more like my profile. I think Maradona and the things that he did for Argentina were absolutely incredible. Um, he's my number three of all time. I think number two is a tough one. Um, Ronaldo is incredible, um, Cristiano that is, and he was always inspiring to watch because of work rate and attitude and that just absolute desire to be the best that he can be, you know, whether he'd won titles already, whether he'd already won the Champions League, whether he'd already conquered in a certain country, he'd just go on and try and do the next bit. But for me, I always think that Pele just outshone him for the stuff that he did with that Brazil team at the World Cup. Don't get me wrong, I know there's quite a few skeptics about Pele and some of his stats and you know the things that he claims to have done or how many goals he claims to have scored. But I think you watch back some of those old videos. I wish, I wish you could watch HD or 4K footage now of Pele at the peak of his game um, because he, he really was incredible. And then the, the best for me, the greatest of all time, if you ask me, is Lionel Messi. I've never seen a player have the impact that he's had on the world game, the impact that he's had on kids, um, you know, the number of kids with the, the name on the back of the shirt, the number of kids that want to play like him, the way that he makes the game look so easy for a guy that's below an average height. It, it should be easier when you're bigger, when you're Van Dyke's profile, when you're 
um, Cristiano's profile and you've got that added height, the game is easier. Essentially, watching Messi do what he does is like watching Manny Pacquiao fighting in a boxing ring against Tyson Fury and still winning and still getting the knockouts and still landing the punches. He's doing it against players that are bigger, that should be stronger, you know, that some of them are faster and he still makes the game look so easy. Um, at the time of recording, it's just after the semi-final against Croatia, where we all saw the assist um, that, that he provided. And he's just incredible. I've never seen a player do that um, so consistently over such a long period of time. And for me, he competes with the best goal scorers in the world ever, but he competes with the best dribblers in the world ever. And he competes with the best playmakers and best assisters of all time as well. So the way that he's done that, is the reason for me that he's number one. You know, Cristiano as a goal scorer, absolutely. Maradona as a talisman for his country and a goal scorer, absolutely. And a, and a great dribbler. But the way that this guy has just dominated world football in dribbling and playmaking and goal scoring, I don't think you'll ever see it again. You'll see Haaland's, you'll see Mbappe's who bag loads of goals. They won't get anywhere near as many assists as Messi. You'll see great dribblers and, and incredibly talented players with their feet. They won't get the same number of goals that Messi's got. So... For me, I think when you put all that together, you stack it on top of each other. Um, the little Argentinian Messi is, for me, the greatest that's, that's ever played the game. Um, certainly in my lifetime, and, and probably, probably one of the best of all time. So guys, that is the end of the video. Please leave a like on this video to help out the channel and please leave us any comments with any questions that you want to ask in the next video. If there's anything you want to know about coaching, you want to know about me, you want to know about football in general, then please let us know in the comments and we will do our best to answer them in the next video. I'm definitely going to come back here to this beautiful golf course again in the future, but might come play foot golf next time. I'll see you soon.